Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you to our studios here. Uh, with me, of course, um, in the studio is our dear brother Jay Smith to discuss yet another one of those interesting topics. This time, we are calling this particular video series that has to do with the um, the critical assessment of the history of Islam, if you wish. Uh, we're calling it Gibson's latest discoveries. Now, what are we talking about here? Dan Gibson, if you've been watching any of our previous, uh, uh, basically, video series on the unknown history of Islam, or what we called also the Qibla controversy, we zoomed in on the findings of our dear brother Dan Gibson, who did studies uh, using the Quran and analyze the geography of the Quran and discovered that there is something interesting when he focused on the towns that supposedly surrounding the live, uh, uh, the community of Muhammad and Mecca and so on and so forth and discovered that it's much further north than um, you, you know, probably would assume it to be, meaning that Mecca, as we know it today, is way south. These towns and those historical, uh, you know, stories that Islam or the Quran is trying to present talk about stories of individuals or uh, towns or people group that are much north. Later on, of course, he discovered that Petra is the ideal location for such area. In fact, he would argue that Petra could be the original, uh, basically, place of the birth of Islam or what we call the original Mecca, if you wish. And we took it from there and we began to explore certain things from his own assessment and analysis, so on and so forth. So this is an ongoing, by the way, research by Gibson. He's going to discover many other things. Today, we are going to unpack the most recent discoveries that he have basically revealed. And we want to definitely take these extremely important findings and give him a much wider platform as well. That's the reason why we're calling it Gibson's uh, Recent Discoveries. Uh, and as a result of this, expect more uh, you know, series along these lines as more and more evidence or discoveries will arise. Dr. J. Smith, thank you again for joining me. This is always exciting uh, series, and people really have been complimenting us on many of these information we've been sharing. Well, this is a, it, it, it is a joy for all of us because if you're talking about history, history, because of the fact that it happened in the past, uh, it, it needs to be investigated. And we always say the historical critique, we want to look at names, dates, places, and events. Those are the four things, names, dates, places, and events. Uh, of course, we also want to look at times factors. So when we have what Dan Gibson has done, and this is why we thank Dan Gibson for all the great work he has done, uh, certainly between 2019, uh, was he say 89 to 2004? But as he's continuing up until 2019, he's still coming back, and we're get, we're gonna do a number of these. As you say, this is now December 2019. We're gonna be doing this in the spring of 2020. We'll probably do another one in the fall of 2020 because there. There is so much new material now starting to ramp it up as more people are getting involved, not just Dan Gibson. Other people are now starting involved right. in this whole uh, question concerning where did Islam really begin? And it looks like more and more what we're finding is, is when we read this book, the Quran, and when we look at the traditions, uh, the, the descriptions in this book about these people that this prophet is having contact with, the areas that he lived, the places that he went to, the certainly uh, the kind of vegetation that, it, that exists around all this is not pointing to Mecca at all. It's pointing to somewhere much further north, northwest, uh, 600 miles further north, Correct. the Nabataean area. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep on, you're right, we're going to keep on just bringing this new material to you who are watching this so that you can keep up to date with all that research that's going on. This one, what we're going to do now in December of 2019, will be updated in the subsequent series that we're going to do. Let's just take a look and let's understand. Now, to do that, we need to back up to what we did in our original series, looking at what Abdul Malik needed. Abdul Malik, who was, uh, uh, I would suggest, he was a Nabataean. He lived north of Petra. He lived way up in Damascus. But he was an Umayyad caliph. He was probably the greatest of the Umayyad caliphs. Caliphs uh, ruled from 685 to 7. 
1905, and he was the one that created the whole Arab identity. Remember, we talked about this. And in creating the Arab identity, he first needed to create a man, a prophet, because he, the Nabataeans, the Arabs, didn't have a prophet. Uh, the Nabataeans uh, didn't have a prophetic line. They didn't have also any revelation like the Jews and the Christians, who were their cousins. The Jews and the Christians, they had a prophetic line through Isaac. They also had revelation, the Old the New Testament, old for the Jews, the new for the Christians. They needed to have that kind of identity. They already now controlled that whole swath of land that uh, of the monarch by that time. He controlled the swath of land from Andalusia all the way over to India. That was an enormous amount of land, but they had nothing to show for it as far as their identity. And that's why he needed a man. And that's why he builds the Dome of the Rock. We talked about this, puts it above the Church of the Sepulchre. And we're going to introduce that a bit more. We're going to unpack that. So once he found he got a man uh, and he uh, uh, introduced him on that Dome of the Rock, that's where he introduced the name Muhammad. He also induced it on coins. That's another series that we've done is looking at the coins where that is introduced uh, with him. He is the one that introduced it on the same year. Actually, a year later, after he introduced it on the Dome of the Rock and on the protocols, he then introduces the man's name. There's his prophet. And of course, then they needed a book because a prophet has to have a revelation. Every prophet has a revelation. Where was this revelation? And that's why the Quran starts to be getting put together. And we're doing a whole other series on when the Quran, the manuscripts that have been put together. In fact, we're going to be doing a great one on looking at where are these earliest manuscripts? How many are they? Uh, that's something that we're going to really tackle because they claim that there are not just six manuscripts now. They're now right. they're claiming more. And we we're going to look at every one of them. This is exciting. But once you have the man, then you have have the book, then you need to have the place. Well, the place was already there. The place was already there. The place already existed for Abdul Malik. That was not a problem. He didn't need a place. The place was right there in Petra. That's right. And the narrative today, though, does not say it's in Petra at all. They put it to Mecca. And that's where Gibson has really been helpful because not certain, certainly not to begin with. Uh, when you look at all the evidence that we've looked at, we've looked at all the kiblas of m the mosques, uh, 20 kiblas of mosques, ancient mosques from the 7th and 8th century, the earliest mosques, in fact, all the earliest mosques, their kiblas, their direct pair, are all facing Petra, 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 Petra. So certainly the kiblas have given that away, and that's why Gibson was so good, because he was able to go back and look at all those mosques and actually go and do the coordinates. Uh, do all the the coordinates, ma uh, modern courts. No, so you have the Kibla facing that uh, that city. Then you need also to look at what else has been found. Now, once you look for this place, you need to go back and see, let's look at Petra and let's look at some things that I would like to specifically pinpoint. Uh, let's put the slide up here uh, to, to see what we're talking about. Petra, uh, one of the great things about Petra is that it fits the biblical account. Right. When you look at uh, Hagar and you look at what's happening with Abraham, we know that Hagar is in a valley. That's very clear. We're going to one mountain and then to another. In fact, the whole tradition in the pilgrimage of going back between Safa and Marwa, Safa and Marwa are those two mountains that supposedly Hagar went to uh, when she was there with her son Ishmael. Abraham comes to talk to her and he turns the corner out of sight, which is exactly what we find with the cliffs in Petra. The thenea, or turning to the right. As yeah, the thenea, that means something <coughs> bent, basically. Yeah. And that's the sick that you find there in Petra. But take, let's take a look at map of Petra. When you look at that map there on the right, you can see that all, if we were to expand it a bit, we, you can see that there is a valley there. You can see that this valley does not exist in Mecca. There is a parallel valley uh, which does not exist in Mecca. You can see as you look at the circled area in red, that's the Christian quarters. That's the, that would be where many of the aristocracy, that's the ones who actually did speak Aramaic. Uh, and it was fascinating, it was they are the ones, we're going to get into this later, how that they are the ones that actually give us chronic Arabic. The chronic Arabic that we see in the Quran, that's unique to the Quran, that everybody notices is different than the Quran that is used in Hadramat area in the south or the Hijaz area in the middle part of Arabia is used in the north and it comes out of this Nabataean. And by the Quran. way, the most popular reading is found uh, uh, from the reading that is in the north also. Out of those canonized reading, the most 
famous one that is found most of the time in the later Quranic manuscripts comes from the north. Okay, so let's go back to that map again and let's take a look there. When you come down and you look at the areas, I just want to get you a visualization of the map. Uh, let's just get take a look at another one here. Here is the uh, another map that's very much the same thing. And you can see when you look at the map that there is a temple of Uzzah and there's also a temple of Dushara. So these al Uzza, who is al Uzza? Well, it's al 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 Uzza, uh, is one a, of the gods, you know, or the idol gods. Actually, she's a goddess. It's or, a female or goddess. Yeah, I mean, basically, yeah, I mean, that's what I mean. It's like an idol uh, that was being worshipped, and it was mentioned in the Quran, Alat wa al Uzza. Alat wa al Uzza. Chapter fifty three, verse nineteen and twenty. Which Surah fifty three. The story of the incident that is known as the Satanic, Satanic verses. verses. You're right. Yeah. Uh, which Al Rushdie made famous with his book called the Satanic Verses. So there you can see the Al Uzza, and then if the orange. Look at the orange area. That is the Temple of Dushara. So I want to pinpoint these two real quickly. There is the Temple of Dushara on the le on the left and on the right. That is there. You can go see it. And it refers to Dushara. So who is this Dushara? Well, Dushara is the Nabataean god, the Nab the god, the great god Dushara, and that's why a temple is dedicated to him. And it's right sits right there in the middle of the valley. What's fascinating is Dushara is his formal name, but his generic name is Ilaha. Ilah. Ilah. Yeah. God, just a god. Which is Allah. Yeah. Allah comes from Ilaha. That's right. So here this Dushara is the God that we see in the Quran. Do we not find it in the Quran? We do. I mean, there's multiple references. And by the way, I would argue that when you say the reference right now, I'll explain uh, why Allah could be taken out of Ilah. Okay. Well, I have it open here, and I'm going to just uh, read this now. I'll read it to you. This is in uh, Surah 3, Ayah 18. It says, Allah bears witness that la ilaha illa huwa. No God but Him. No and God but Him. Ila, la ila illa huwa, meaning this ila is the unique one that represents Him. So this ila is the name, actually, is a generic name for Dushara. So the God that we see in the Quran, that's repeated in chapter 37, verse 35. That's also repeated in chapter 47, verse 19. Three places that I've just looked up real quickly. I'm sorry, you looked them up real quickly, and we found them real quickly. Yeah. Um, there may be more than that, but those are three you can look at. So that's chapter 3, yeah. verse 18, chapter 37, verse 35, and chapter 47, verse 19. Now, I would argue that because of these kind of uh, uh, verses uh, that uh, the definite article was added because there is no God uh, or no Ilah but Allah, basically, that you add the definite article al to ilah and becomes Allah, technically Ooh, speaking. There's yeah. ilah I mean, becomes al, why don't you put al there? That's my theory. Again, I wouldn't want people to go ahead and, and attack me over this. But I'm saying it's very obvious to me in Arabic that once you add the definite article, la ilaha, meaning there is no God but Allah, meaning this is the one. Well, if there is article. another God, then 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 you have to throw out chapter exactly. 3, verse 18. Because exactly. it said there is no other but this exactly. God. Exactly. So this is Allah, because this is the only God that's referred to in the Bible. Right. So you, by definition, it would it would summarize that they're talking about this God, which right. is a Nabataean God, and that's his temple that we saw that we showed up there. Right. But I'm going to go one step further. I want to show this slide here, because this slide, if we look at, put, put it up there, this slide here is Alat. Now, is not alat the feminine form of Allah? Yes. In Arabic? Exactly. So alat is the feminine form of Allah, which is the, the generic name for Al-Uzza. Al-Uzza is the goddess, the consort of Dushara, who is Ilaha, which means that alat and Al-Uzza is the same goddess. Al-Uzza would be the formal name, and that's why we have here, you can see uh, the pictures of her. She is well known in Nabataean culture. Uh, she is found uh, in many, uh, not just in Petra, she's found in other cities. She's also found as far away as Palmyra. So all over, she is very popular. She is the wife of Dushara, who is Ilaha, who is Allah. Allah is her generic name as Ilaha, or Allah is the generic name for Dushara. So here you have Dushara, the god of the Nabataeans, has a wife. Now, do you see a problem with that in the Quran in chapter 6, verse 101? 
Well, uh, I mean, certainly uh, there is a big case to be made, but let me let me play the devil's advocate right now. I mean, I, I would like for you to unpack this. You know, uh, they, they, somebody come come back and, and, and push against this. Uh, wait a minute, the Quran was very specific. Alat wa al uzza two, not the same one. What would we say about that, for instance? I would say that they didn't look at their history very well, and they didn't actually go back, just like they didn't look at, see, they shouldn't have been using ilaha, they should have used dushara. There's the problem. Whoever wrote the Quran did not, were writing it, looks like in the 8th century, they were not going and actually unpacking it. It looks like, in this case, they did not understand what the God of Islam. So uh, technically what you're saying, there is the feminine God and the masculine God. Feminine God and masculine God. Husband and God. wife. Except if they had gone to, uh, if they'd really gone to Petra, they would have seen there are actually two different temples. And it's according to the Nabataean writings, this is the wife of Dushara. But in chapter 6, verse 101, it says very clearly, he, that's referring to Allah, is the originator of the heavens and the earth, so it has to be Allah. How can he have children when he has no wife? The Quran is very clear that God has no wife. The Quran is very clear that God has no wife. Right. Then they shouldn't have used Ilaha, should they? That's right. So They shouldn't have used Allah. When you use that, then you're getting into something that contradicts the declaration here. It contradicts the declaration. It looks like the God of Islam, according to what we're seeing from Petra, the God of Islam from Petra did have a wife. Her name was Aluza, whose generic title was Alat. Alat. And, of course, Dushara would have been the god of the Petra, whose type, uh, generic title is Ilaha. So, really, we're talking about a god who, in the Quran, that only has a title. That's not his name. That's right. And, and that's very clear, by the way. I mean, uh, no one can argue that this is, is his proper name. It's just a title. It's just a title. The god. Yeah. I'd like to know his name. Yeah. Can you see? It's great as we're doing unpacking this, and we're going to give even better. We need to go and we need to uh, st cut, shut this one down for now. What I'd like to do when we come back is to start to look at the different stages of the Hajj. Can we find these stages in Petra? And that will be interesting. So uh, thank you so much, of course, for um, this exciting introduction to this series. And as you can see, um, there is more and more discoveries that are being made, and we would like really to keep up with those latest discoveries. That's why we called it Gibson's latest discoveries. Uh, there is a reason why we're calling it this way. Obviously, in every video, as our uh, you know standard, you you'll read the description of that video, and you'll know what exactly is covered under that particular video. In case you're interested, just in a specific thing to watch. Until you join us next week, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel Sierra International and be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and it will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.